Hey, you guys, just wanted to make you a quick recording here of our first couple sections of chapter 19. This is going to be chapter uh, 19, sections one through three about nuclear chemistry. Uh, we've got a few pictures here on the front that discuss a little bit about what we're going to be talking about as far as how is nuclear chemistry used um, for radiation, uh, for this example of the strawberries. It's kind of interesting to learn that strawberries are irradiated most of the time. Uh, before they are shipped or whatever, because they degrade very, very quickly due to fungi and various other microorganisms. And these microorganisms that are already in the strawberries in here, they make the strawberries degrade so quickly, uh, but by irradiating the sample uh, or of strawberries, they, they'll last a lot longer. So that's kind of interesting, but the, the food itself does not uh, become radioactive. So we'll be looking at some how uh, this the radiation is done, really. Now for this other picture here, you'll see uh, here what looks like the sun, and that's because we'll be studying fusion. Fusion is what occurs in the sun, and it's a nuclear reaction. We'll also be studying fission. Fission is where uh, the radiation is produced that is used to irradiate these strawberries. So that's fission. Fission means to break into pieces. Fusion means to come together. Okay, let's, let's continue on. Oh, first, what we're going to do is compare nuclear and chemical equations. You've heard of, you've been studying chemi chemistry for a while now, and do you have a feel for what uh, these chemical chemicals do in chemical reactions? But there's a little bit of difference when it's nuclear chemical equation or reaction versus a regular chemical reaction. So in chemical reactions, atoms normally are rearranged by the breaking and forming of chemical bonds just like this burning of methane, where in nuclear reactions, elements are converted from one to another, it, such as in this nuclear conversion. That's what it looks like here. You have uranium being hit with a neutron, and then it fissions to become a cesium and a rubidium atom, and two neutrons then zip off to go do other things. Chemical reactions, only electrons in atomic and molecular orbitals are involved. Uh, so those are those electrons in those outer shells that we've been used to, like in our Bohr atom and so on. But in nuclear, protons, neutrons, and electrons, all of these things and other uh, elementary particles are involved, but they come from the nucleus. The nucleus is where you will find the protons, neutrons, and electrons that are interacting. In chemical reactions, and chemical reactions are accompanied by absorption and release of, of relatively small amounts of energy. But in nuclear, there are very large amounts of energy. So when we're doing nuclear reactions, we're actually using a very small amount of material. And most of the time, the energy that's given off during nuclear transformations um, can only, only a small portion of it can be harnessed. That's why they need to get a lot of the material, like a bunch of uranium or plutonium to cause a, a big explosion. In chemical reactions, rates of reactions are influenced by temperature, pr temperature, pressure, concentration, and catalysts, whereas in nuclear, they are not influenced by any of these things. A, nuclear, a nucleus of a radioactive element just does its thing. You can yell at it, you can scream at it, it just does its thing at a certain rate in kinetics like we'll learn later. So let's do a quick review here about some subatomic particles. The atomic number, remember, is the number of protons in the nucleus. The mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. And when we look at our isotopic notation, that's the element symbol is given as well as, well as the mass number and the atomic number. We will use this a lot in nuclear uh, chemistry. So let's look at some of our subatomic particles and how they're uh, indicated by symbols. A proton has uh, its A or mass number is one, its Z is one. And you can see the one and the one right here or the one and the one right here. A neutron has an A of one and a Z of zero. That means that bottom number, which is the atomic number, is number of protons. It does not have any. Electrons are indicated by an E or a beta. Beta particles come from the nucleus during decay. Electrons like this are usually from outside sources that can be captured within the nucleus. So that's why they have different symbols, even though they're the same thing. Their A is zero and their Z is negative one. And what's kind of weird about this is the reason we give them these numbers is because when they are in these balanced nuclear chemical equations, 
uh, the, the numbers from products to reactants balance. A positron is similar to an electron, but with a positive charge. Again, the numbers are put there to balance in our equations. And an alpha particle, the largest of these subatomic particles of radiation, have a mass number of four and an atomic number of two. It's an alpha particle, which is, an, which is a helium nucleus. These are actually two plus charged, but it's not indicated. That's the same uh, nucleus that Rutherford used to bombard the gold oil. But let's just do a quick balancing act here. When we balance nuclear equations, you'll notice that the top number, which is the mass number, should match its sum of the top numbers over here, and then the bottom numbers will match over here. So that's what this is showing here. 235 plus 1 is 236, and then all of this is 236. And it's giving the same information down here. So your mass number should be conserved and your atomic number should be conserved. Here's a quick example. Polonium decays by alpha emission. To write the balanced nuclear equation for that decay, since it's alpha emission, you need an alpha particle that's decayed on the product side. And then the next goal is to do a little bit of simple math to figure out what nucleus is resulting from alpha decay of a polonium nucleus. So if you do a little bit of math up there, for the product, you'll see an A of 208 and a Z of 82, and that must be lead. Lead 208 is the decay product when polonium decays through alpha emission, uh, creates lead 208. So now, fun sheet, you should be ready to do fun sheet question number one, which is looking at these, uh, looking at these uh, types of reactions and then balancing. Now, fungi question number one also asks you for the type. Now, there's different types of transmutations, TYPE, different types. This is called an alpha emission. So an alpha emission results in an alpha particle being kicked out of the nucleus and something else, another nucleus on the other side. It could be many different things. There's alpha emission, there's beta emission, there's fission, there is fusion. So all these types, just keep this in mind as we cover the whole chapter, you can go back to this problem and then fill in uh, fusion, fill in the different types. There's transmutation, nuclear transmutation, where one nucleus is converted to another. This problem here is that we just did right here is not transmutation. Transmutation is where an, uh, a particle, um, an, a nucleus is hit with a small particle and another nucleus and another small particle results. So that's a little bit different. Um, I think these are the main uh, types that you are asked for in fun sheet question number one. So just hold off on that until maybe you finish the chapter even and you can go back and fill those in. Let's quick talk about nuclear stability. The reason that nuclear nuclei decay within a nucleus is because of an instability. So what makes something stable? There are certain numbers of neutrons and protons that are extra stable. And these are kind of, they're even. And you see a lot of times they're called the magic numbers. They're like extra stable numbers of electrons in the noble gases. 2, 8, 20, 50, 82, these all are even. And I th as far as I know, there's also a system to how a nucleus is built within an atom, and it's in shells similar to uh, electrons. So nuclei with even numbers of both protons and neutrons are more stable than those with odd. We'll talk about that more in a second of why that's the case. So just think about that. Why is that? Why do you think that that would be uh, important? All isotopes of the elements with atomic numbers higher than 83 are radioactive. 83 is bismuth. So everything above that is radioactive in some way. All isotopes of technetium and promethium are radioactive. This table is showing you uh, the number of stable isotopes with even and odd numbers of protons and neutrons. And this is kind of interesting because if you just check out this pattern, you have an odd and an odd and you have four isotopes, where you have an even and an even and you have 164 stable isotopes. So this is showing you kind of what we were talking about up here, things that are extra stable even is kind of the key word there. Now an even and an odd and an odd versus an even, they're kind of the same. You got 50 and 53. We'll look more closely at why 
the uh, protons and neutrons and their ratio has an effect on the stability of an atom. So let's look at types of radioactive decay. I'm going to show you some kind of, I call them baby reactions or small reactions of, uh, of a nuclear decay. A beta decay is where a beta particle is ejected from a nucleus. Now, what is a beta particle? To understand this a little bit better, I show these, I hope, no, no, they're not here. I'm looking for a baby reaction or a small reaction that interconverts the three main subatomic particles. So you have a beta particle, which is zero, negative one, you have a neutron, which is one, zero, and you have a proton, which is one and one. And these interconvert between each other. So if we look at this carbon-14 going to nitrogen-14 in a beta particle, something has changed. The number of protons has decreased by one, or is it neutrons? Oh no, yeah, looky here. I messed that up. This six is number of protons, and it increased by one. That means a neutron was destroyed. So let's write a neutron. A neutron is a one and a zero, and it was changed to a proton, one and one. Now the question is, where is that electron? If I put the electron over here, this beta particle, which is like an electron, I get a zero and a negative one. Now if we do some math here, one plus negative one equals zero and one plus zero equals one. So this is that small reaction that shows you the interconversion of those subatomic particles. This proton stays in the nucleus. Okay. And there it is. That's the little reaction that I was looking for, which is the one that I just drew. Okay, how about positron decay? It raises the neutron to proton ratio. And a neutron to proton ratio is really nice if it's one to one in the small atoms. When you get to really large, heavy nucleus atoms, then you end up wanting more neutrons than protons because of too many protons resist each other and want to repel. So the more no neutrons you can have in there that kind of get in between them, it will make them more stable. But looking at positron decay, here's an example of a positron decay. A positron is ejected from the nucleus. Carbon is transformed into boron. You have an increase in your number of neutrons. And here's that little reaction. A proton now was converted into a neutron. This guy stays in the nucleus. This is ejected from the nucleus as a certain type of radiation. It's called positron radiation. This was beta radiation, beta particle radiation. Electron capture is another type of reaction that you would see on your number one fun sheet uh, because electron capture is a nuclear uh, inter exchange. So this one increases the number of neutrons by one, decreases the protons, and there's that small reaction that shows the interplay between those subatomic particles. This electron comes zipping into the nucleus, encounters a proton, gets converted to a neutron, your neutrons go up by one, your protons go down by one. Alpha decay, one of the most common for the big heavy nuclei is that alpha particle is ejected from the nucleus. Decreases your number of neutrons by two. Spontaneous fission is when a very heavy nucleus is very unstable and it just fissions into two intermediate sized nucleus, nuclei. So this belt of stability, your book talks about this in, in, in so far that, remember I was saying the very small nuclei way down here have a neutron to proton ratio of one to one. But then as you get larger, there's a deviation that occurs from this one to one relationship because you need more neutrons. Now, as you get pretty heavy up here, there's different types of radiation that can occur to make the uh, a nuclei more stable. If your neutron to proton ratio is getting too large, then by, through beta decay, your nuclei will kind of approach this belt of stability. If the N to P is too small, you want, the nucleus will undergo positron decay or electron capture. We'll see some examples of that. I have another picture here, very similar. Uh, this is the number of neutrons. Again, this is like a belt of stability. 
again, you see when it's small, one to one is good, but then it deviates. This figure gives a little bit more information is that on this side of your belt of stability, beta particles are emitted. Here's your stability line. Here's your N to Z line for one to one. And then on this side, there's a beta positron emitter. And then way up here is the alpha particle emitter because that's for the really heavy guys. The really heavy guys like to emit alpha particles because the alpha particle is heavy. So for our fun sheet questions two through four, just wanted to look at this one with you real quick. When we think about how dense a nucleus is anyway, I mean, we'll say it's the most dense part of the atom. Uh, your book on page 859 gives you some information about the density of a nucleus. So at uh, uranium-235 specifically. So if you check out page 859 in your textbook, you will see some information that will help you calculate the density of a nucleus. Now remember, density is given in grams per centimeter cubed. So you're given a radius of uranium-235 nucleus in picometers. So you might want to think about converting picometers to centimeters and getting a cubic value for that, and then determining the amount of grams that one atom of uranium weighs. And then you can do your D equals M over B for that. I'm not going to give it away too much. I'll let you guys work on that. For fun sheet question number three, this one is giving you a set of elements, a pair, and asking you which one is more stable, which one has more stable isotopes. So recall the number of stable isotopes has to do with the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Now I believe this is a question right out of your textbook uh, towards the end of the chapter. It is uh, problem 19 point, let me look real quick here, 19. Seventeen. So it's asking the same question for each pair. Predict which one has more stable isotopes. So you want to look at the number of protons and neutrons and see whether they're odd or even or, or how that falls into those numbers that we talked about previously. For number four, it's kind of similar, but now they're the same element, but they're different isotopes. So since they're different isotopes, they have a different proton to neutron ratio. So look at the proton to neutron ratio and see what which one do you think is more stable and then also the one that's unstable what type of particle would it emit to become stable positrons or alpha particles probably not alpha particles for this guy he's too light but uh, positrons or beta particles or something like that. now you might be wondering why are certain um, nuclei not stable or why are they stable and that has to do with nuclear binding energy and this nuclear binding energy is the energy required to break up a nucleus in, into its component protons and neutrons this kind of sounds like lattice energy if you recall but this is actually for an individual element so if we have a, an element an atom of that element like fluorine 19 which has nine protons and 10 neutrons there's a certain amount of energy that would go into breaking it up now, of course, if you reverse this, that amount of energy would be given right back off again. Now, the reason this formula comes into this scenario is because there's an energy involved from a mass change in a chemical reaction. The mass change that occurs and its energy is dependent upon the speed of light. And the reason it's dependent upon the speed of light is because those uh, particles that are ejected are moving at close to the speeds of light. And that interconverts mass and energy. So let's see how this works. A mass defect is calculated by taking the number of protons and adding them with a number of electron, a number of uh, neutrons, I'm sorry, and subtracting the mass of the initial atom. So let's check this out. These numbers you can look up. Those are the number of neutrons and the number of protons. This number, what is this number? Is this number from the periodic table? Or is this number the actual mass of a fluorine 19 nucleus, fluorine 19, as determined by a mass spectrometer? I believe it's that's what it is. It's determined by a mass spectrometer, not from the periodic table, even though it kind of looks like that. So again, this mass defect, once you do this 
calculation, this is called the mass defect. Plug it into your equals mc squared, and you get a value of amu in meters squared per second squared. You can see that probably what's going to happen, we're going to get a number in joules, because we, if, once we convert this guy to kilograms, we're going to end up with joules. So your book gives you a conversion factor for kilograms and AMUs. Remember, AMU is an atomic mass unit, which actually has a mass. And so we can go ahead and use that to convert it to joules. So this is the joules or the nuclear binding energy for 319. So I took it to the next slide and I plugged it in right here using Avogadro's number. This is joules, but this is for one atom. So I wanted to put it on a per mole basis. So I multiplied it by Avogadro's number and I got 1.43, now that I've, I've covered it up there, times 10 to the negative, I can't see it, no, it's positive, 13 joules per mole. And that's a pretty big number. Now you might be questioning this negative. This negative just means that when this occurs, the system loses energy. Oh, it's a, no, it's a 10. This was joules, now it's kilojoules. That's why it uh, went from 13 to 10. So the nuclear binding energy then for, for fluorine is one point, per mole, 1.43 times 10 to the 10th. Now on a per nucleon basis, what's interesting about nuclear binding energy is that it's, there's a it's like a, it's kind of a trend or you see a, a change when you put it on a per nucleon basis. A nucleon is neutrons and protons. So for fluorine 19, there are 19 altogether neutrons and protons. So you divide it by that and you get this joules per nucleon. So then when we compare them to everybody else, like on this slide, we can compare on a per nucleon basis, fluorine 19, I don't know, it's right, it must be right around here somewhere, because here's a mass number, see so it would be right in here somewhere. As your number of nucleons uh, or mass number increases, your nuclear binding energy skyrockets for a while, and then it starts to fall off. And I believe this is because it becomes, starts to be, these atom, heavy atoms up here become, start to become less stable than the lighter ones here. So as nuclear binding energy increase, per nucleon increases, the stability increases, like I said, for a while. So for Funchy question number five, just go back to those slides or in your textbook. Your textbook has examples like this. Uh, specifically, example number uh, 19.2 has an example for you to follow uh, about these. So figure out the nuclear binding energy for a chlorine-35 nucleus and an iodine-127 nucleus. Let's continue on with our chapter here, our last section of this video, which is natural radioactivity. There are elements that radioactivity naturally. One of them you're probably most familiar with is uranium-238. Uranium-238 is uh, radioactive, and it's radioactive. And I think uranium-235, where is, let's find uranium-235 if it's on here. I don't see it. Uranium-235 is also radioactive. And you'll see a huge half-life here for its alpha particle emission. And um, so it takes a very long time. These are all half-lives. And these talk, and this natural radioactivity decay series also shows the particle that is being emitted for each one of these reactions. So these are little reactions. They're nuclear decay reactions. And every time you get something kicked off over here, and the half-life is given. Further down, you can see there's different, different pathways that can be taken, which might explain some of the uh, percentages of minerals and atoms that are in the Earth and in the Earth's crust. And lead-206 is a very stable element uh, that the uranium decay series ends up in. So the lead to uranium ratio can give us some information about how old things are. So let's talk about the kinetics. Now, luckily, there's only one kinetic decay that occurs for this radioactive decay. So when something decays from its initial to a daughter, this is like reactants to products, kind of like we have already done. So these are reactants, and then this is the product. They just like to call it the daughter. There's a rate. That's a rate law. This rate law is no different from the rate law that you learned about in Chapter 13. It's rate 
equals, but instead of K, like we're normally used to, and then we have the constant, we have the concentration of reactants here raised to some stoichiometric coefficient. They're going to use this lambda, and this lambda is the rate constant for a radioactive decay, and it's specific for a specific nuclei. So if you recall the differential rate laws, this is a, now notice this is a one here. So since this is a one, this is a first order reaction and a first order rate law. And this is the, uh, the uh, derived rate law for a first order reaction. Okay, so those are, this is what we've seen before. There's an initial amount as by the zero. There's a, an amount of those atoms of that nuclei left over after a certain amount of time t. And that time t is right here. And this depends upon the rate constant or first order rate constant for this nuclear decay. Now remember half-life, this half-life is the same for these first order reactions. It doesn't depend upon starting concentration. And the half-life, remember this 0.693 was ln of two, if you recall, over lambda is the same thing. We put it as k last time in chapter 13. This is why radiocarbon dating is possible for us to take a piece of material that was once living and look at the, um, the proportion of carbon-14 that's still in that item, and that gives us information about how old it is. Carbon-14 decays at a, at a known rate of 5,730 years, that's its half-life, and it undergoes beta emission when it does it. Uranium is also used for dating rocks and things like that because it, there's a certain ratio, if you remember that decay series, that um, uranium-238 to that lead-206, there's a certain, we know the path that it takes. And if you go back to that nuclear decay series, you'll see times for all of these of how long each one of these processes takes to occur. And that's why we can know how long uh, this process takes. And if you, we, what happens is that there's an assumption made of how much lead um, and uranium was in the sample. And then looking at the new ratio or the ratio in the sample, you can get an idea of its age. And there's that, let's just talk about the ratio. If we assume that it was all uranium-238 and then it took this amount of time, you can look at the ratio between the two and give you an idea of how old it is. Potassium-40 is also used uh, to date ge geological uh, substances and that's why it's important in geochemistry. So potassium-40 decays to argon-40. And one time I was thinking, well, what, what elements or minerals have potassium in them anyway? And hanksite is one of these things. It's a sulfate mineral. And it has, look at its formula, it's quite uh, complicated. It has sulfate and carbonate in it. And if you remember from chapter 11, how we did unit cells, uh, this is the unit cell for hanksite. It's got a lot of cool stuff in there. So for question number five, now that we've talked about natural radioactivity, uh, now what we want to do is utilize the relationships that we just learned, that it was first order, and the der derived first order rate equation to determine the number of atoms left over. So I'll let you guys try that one. Fun sheet number six, I always thought this was interesting because what you can do with, if you have a certain substance that's radioactive, it will undergo multiple steps. And those multiple steps uh, can result in a non-radioactive substance. And given half-lives for each one of these processes, we can determine how much of each substance will be left over. So in this example, you're given the fact that A has a half-life of 4.5 seconds, B has a half-life of 15 days, C has a half-life of one second, and D is non-radioactive. So D, this is kind of like thinking, well, this is lead, right? Lead 206. Lead 206 is non-radioactive, so it's like the end of the line. So then if you look at all the other ones and their half-lives, you can get an idea of how much of each one is left over. Now the relationship that we just learned about, I think I have it right here, T1 half is equal to 0.693 over lambda, you can get use this relationship to determine the lambda or, or rate constant for a specific nuclei from the half-life. And then once you know that, you can plug it into this equation to get how much is left over 
given how much you started with over a certain amount of time. Now you'll notice in this equation, your time is 15, no, it's not, it's 30 days. So that 30 days you can use and calculate the amount left over for each one of those species. For questions seven through nine, we're still using the same um, relationships that we just learned about, which was that first order uh, where T1 half is equal to 0 0.693 over lambda and your rate equation to derived rate equation to determine things like how many, how old, how old would be the T in that equation where you had your LN of A, oh, N at time T divided by N naught equals minus lambda T. This how old would be right here. You'd have to have this information and the rate constant. You can get that rate constant from the half-life up here. These are the two equations, they talk to each other, that you can get a half-life from a lambda, and then you can use a lambda to determine how old or how much. This one is how many? Number seven is how many? So if it's how many, you're given a half-life, so you can get a lambda, you're given an original amount, and you're given a time. What you really gotta be careful about is whether or not your times match um, as far as your lambda is concerned and your half-life and when you plug it back in, just make sure your units match as far as time is concerned. And then this one is down here is what fraction? That's the same type of idea. How much? 